Christ is risen, and on April the 23rd, we commemorate Saint George the Trophy Bearer, an amazing saint who today is fighting as tirelessly for souls now as he was before his martyrdom at the hands of Emperor Diocletian. Indeed, it is truly a joyous, bright week, and the Orthodox have so much to be emboldened by and take heart in. Christ is truly risen from the dead. We have seen the holy fire, and we also hear countless accounts of his saints interceding daily for the salvation of souls. Ours is truly a living faith. And God uses his saints to strengthen and protect his people and to show his love for them. There is a touching story of St. George and his intervention that happened just a little over a year ago in which he finds an open and pure heart and a Muslim woman who begins to appear to and teach about the one true faith. And while St. George is so active among the faithful, as well as those open to hear the good news of the gospel, what makes this story touching and powerful is that he entrusts to this particular young woman his own personal cross, the cross that he carved in this life and carried with him by a special favor of Christ into heaven. This cross is a relic that St. George made while still in the flesh, and the reason the saint asked God if he could have permission to bring the cross with him into heaven is because it helped him so much in life and throughout his terrible and lengthy period of martyrdom. And now, only a little over a year ago, St. George has entrusted this very miracle-performing cross to this young Turkish woman, who he converted to Orthodoxy, and through her story and the power of the cross, which is currently traveling between monasteries around Greece, is working miracles. The faith of many is being strengthened. You can watch Sophia's interview with Elder Nectarius on his YouTube channel. It is a wonderful story, and I will provide a link to it. We should learn as much as we can about this wonderful saint who takes such personal interest in each of us and what follows is an account of his life written only a short duration after he began interceding for souls on earth from heaven. It is written by Abba Theodotus, Bishop of Inkira. The Encomium which the blessed Abba Theodotus, Bishop of Ankira, in the year 445 in Galatia, pronounced on the day of the glorious commemoration, which is the 23rd of April, of St. George, the martyr of Diospolis, Palestine, the son of the truth, the star of the morning, the mighty man of the Galileans from Mil Militani, and the valiant soldier of Christ. And he showed forth his family relationships and the mighty conflicts which he endured and the honors which he received in heaven in the peace of God. Amen. It is meet and right and fitting for our souls, O holy beloved, that we should commemorate the sufferings and honorable contests of the saints, and more especially of St. George the Mighty, the most excellent and honorable athlete and warrior, whose festival we celebrate today in this glorious commemoration, who has shown himself to us approved by God and love worthy before men, by reason of the righteous deeds which he displayed through which he was worthy of being called into the healthful sufferings of Christ and of bearing wounds in his body for Christ's sake. He was perfect in great endurance and mighty valor and a pure heart and in giving up his entire will to God through the great zeal which he had in his heart towards God and in the fear of him which he had within him which bore fruit plentifully to him a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold, 
Moreover, he forsook his own will, and the multiplying of his great wealth, and his servants, and all his riches, and hearkened unto the voice of God, and took up his cross, and walked after our Lord Jesus, following after him with an upright heart. On this account he received so great an honor from Christ, that he spake to him with an oath, saying, Among all the martyrs who have existed there shall not be one like unto thee in heaven, neither shall there be any like unto thee forever. He burned with the Holy Spirit, and performed his daily life with zeal, that he might be among those that are chosen and that benefit our souls. In short, he performed the whole will of God and put himself beyond the reach of every thought which could offend the soul. He lived in the service of God and was remote from the vain sights of this life which are like dreams and which pass away quickly like shadows. For this reason, he longed for heaven, remembering what the blessed Paul said, If ye be risen with Christ, seek after the things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God, and remember the things which are above, and not those which are upon earth. Neither his father's rank of court, nor the high birth of his mother, nor the glory of his soldierhood, could overcome the decision of the truly noble and holy St. George. Neither could any one of these lead him astray, or seduce him to forsake his piety and firm decision and perfect faith. The grace of God perfected him in everything concerning which he was anxious, and he feared God, who watched over him, and God strengthened him on every side, like a precious stone of adamant, that he might never be moved. On this account, when the time of persecution came, the heart of the holy Saint George was ready, and when God called him into the holy contest, he was prompt to obey. Moreover, he went to the holy contest and marched through it by himself, and when they tortured him, he became valiant and was firm and resisted his enemies. He fought with impious governors and received the crown of incorruptibility forever and an imperial scepter and royal throne from the true and holy bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only himself, but multitudes of souls received crowns through him during the seven years in which they tortured him. If God in his true knowledge permit us, we hope to make manifest to you in this encomium the exalted honors of St. George, the valiant athlete and soldier of Christ, the holy and noble man of Melatini, for the subject under discussion weighs upon us and compels us to show you everything truly. My heart rejoices greatly within me, this day urges me to speak more especially in honor of St. George, the great luminary, whose festival is celebrated today throughout the whole world. To him the Lord testified by oath, saying, I swear by myself and by my Holy Father and the Holy Spirit that among all those born of women there is not one like unto John the Baptist, and that in the whole army of martyrs there is not what like one like unto thee, neither shall there be one like unto thee forever. For thou shalt be more exalted than they all in the kingdom of heaven, and they all shall call thee George the Beloved of God the Highest. I am afraid, O my beloved, to begin to speak in honor of this great illuminator and warrior, for I know the poverty of my intellect and the feebleness of my halting speech and that I shall not attain to the measure of his exalted and excellent contest. But I hope and trust that the Lord will send me the rays of the light of the valiant man to illuminate my heart and to quicken my halting tongue, that I may speak a few words in his honor to a Christ-loving congregation. And since the description of the honor of this valiant man, O beloved, 
is above the conception of every man upon the earth, more especially of my humble tongue, I, who desire to speak in honor of a holy Saint George, the valiant martyr, need wisdom from the Lord, and a celestial tongue, that I may not omit anything of the mighty and exalted contests of that noble and valiant man, which he fought before all people through his great endurance and bravery. And also, he is honor worthy for each deed of valor which he wrought with great sufferings and a great number of contests, and if the Lord permit, we will set before you a few of them. But meanwhile, we will set before you the qualities of which we have spoken of his brave, of this brave soldier of Christ, St. George. And what are these qualities? His upright and unwavering faith in God, his certain hope, his sincere love, his compassion for everyone and the whole human race, his gentleness to all creatures, both great and small, his benignity, his goodness, his zeal, his patient endurance of the cares of this life, his good disposition and the joy of his soul, the blamelessness of his heart, his taking his stand at the tribunal boldly, his freedom of speech before the governors, entirely without shame or fear of man. As David the psalmist said, I will speak thy testimonies before kings, and will not be ashamed his patient endurance of tortures with great joy of heart, and the other sufferings which he bore for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of these contests we will set forth a few before you, as we promised to do in the beginning of the preface, the contests about which he heard that blessed voice of the Lord saying, As my Father has appointed me a kingdom, so also will I appoint you, who stand with me in my temptation, an unending and indestructible kingdom forever. And again, ye shall eat and drink with me in my kingdom. By reason of the words, full of joy and every happiness, St. George was especially ready for the strife, and the remembrance of those good things made suffering light to him. He bore everything with, ready, with a ready will, for he was gladly prompt in everything. Nothing stood in the way of his rigid resol resolution to suffer, for the sufferings of this world prepared him for the good things of the world to come, and patient endurance prepared for him the crown of incorruptibility forever in heaven. We have extended our preface a little until now, O beloved, and have not as yet set forth before you the glorious, and marvel-worthy sufferings of St. George, the athletic martyr of Christ, who warred and fought against impiety. But now we will proclaim to you the things which we have set down, together with those which we shall say after them. Now it came to pass, in the times of old, that when Diodianus, the king, the great king of the Persians, had obtained sovereignty, he ruled over the whole world. Now it is said of this tyrannical governor that he was lord of the whole world, but the true lord of the world, who is over all things, and who gave us this dominion, was not known. And everyone carried his life in his hand, for he knew that the devil, the father of all wickedness, was envious of our race at all times. Now, when the devil saw the faith of Christ increasing day by day throughout the whole world, he was filled with great envy, and entered into the heart of that impious governor, Dedianus, who was more wicked than anyone else on the whole earth, and who hardened his heart like Pharaoh of old, and raised up a great persecution against all Christians. And he sat down and issued an edict, to all the world, in which was written as follows. Inasmuch as a rumor has reached my ears, that he whom Mary bore, and whom the ravening wolves of Jews slew, is to be worshipped and served by all people, and that Apollo, and Poseidon, 
and Hermes and Zeus and Artemis and the rest of the gods are not to be worshipped, I write to you, O all ye governors of the whole and world upon whose head rests the authority of empire, that ye may all come to me with your followers, counts, generals, soldiers, tribunes, and rustics, that ye may know what I wish to ask of you. And he sent copies of the edict throughout the whole world, and sixty-nine governors, each with his retina, were gathered together from all parts of the world, and came to him at the end of five years. And when they came to him, the whole country was in an uproar by reason of the greatness of the vast and innumerable multitude of those who were with them. When that wicked tyrant saw that they threw themselves down at his feet and worshipped him and gave him gifts, his heart was puffed up exceedingly, and he roared like a lion, and he feasted with them for seventy days, and did not sit in judgment at all, for he feasted every day. After seventy days, Dadianus, the impious, godless, and senseless governor, and sixty-nine other governors, making seventy godless governors in all, sat upon the tribune, and caused them to bring before him all the instruments of the torture chamber, the instruments for trial, the iron bars, the axes, the two-edged swords, the saws, the wheels, the iron hooks, the scrapers of brass, the brazen cauldrons, the knives for splitting the tongue, the iron hands for splitting the bones, the large knives with saw-like edges, the workmen's chisels into which were fitted sharp pieces of iron, and the other instruments of torture which we cannot describe. Now all these had been prepared by the governor for those days, and the tyrannical governor swore an oath before the sixty-nine governors and the whole army, saying, If my hands find any persons throughout the whole world who are doubtful about serving the gods concerning whom we have given commands, I swear by the might of my kingdom that I will torture them with all these instruments which lie before me. I will smash in their skulls, I will saw off their legs, and I will take out their brains through their nostrils. And as for you, O governors, and everyone who hears me today, go ye all and worship the glorious gods that ye may receive the more honor, honors from my majesty. But as for those who will not obey me, and who believe in Jesus, on Jesus, whom the Jews crucified, I swear by the might of my kingdom and the crown upon my head that I will lave all these instruments in the blood of their own bodies and in the blood of their sons and tender daughters, that I will confiscate all their property and that I will burn them alive. And the governors and all of the multitude cast themselves down and worshipped the polluted gods. When all those who believed in God heard of this oath, they were dismayed and terror-stricken by reason of the storm which had risen up against the Church of Christ. Thus three years passed over the world without anyone daring to utter from his lips the words, I am a Christian. And there was much tribulation of heart throughout the world, and no one uttered the name of the Lord from his mouth. But listen, O beloved, and I will declare to you what happened after these things. For it is time to lead you to this honorable man and champion of Jesus Christ, this valiant conqueror, this verifiable pearl of God, this new David who destroyed Goliath, which is the devil and his wicked dragon, this son of truth in the heavens, this luminary whose radiance and light illuminated the whole world this man whose festival is celebrated today throughout the whole world. St. George, the beloved of God and his angels, came from the country of Cappadocia and was the son of the governor of Diospolis. His father, an exceedingly orthodox man, died and left the righteous man, then ten years old, and his two sisters, one of whom was called Cassia, and the other, Mathrona. Now, 
They were exceeding rich in gold and silver, and they had men servants and maid servants in exceeding great number, and immense herds of cattle and fine horses and countless flocks of sheep. In short, they were none like unto them in all Palestine and its borders, and all the city loved them because of the good deeds which they wrought for everyone. Shortly after the death of St. George's father, a new governor was appointed over the country of Palestine in his stead, and he was a great lover of God, and he knew of the rank of the righteous man and of the good birth of his parents, and he had no child except a daughter two years old. When he came into the city with a mighty following, such as befitted the, his dignity and honor and greatness, he sent and fetched the holy youth, St. George, and kissed him many times, and wept for the removal of his father by death. And afterwards he entreated his mother to give him St. George, that he might be to him as a son, and that he might appoint him general over all the multitude that was with him. And she gave him, and he sent him to the king with one hundred soldiers, and he wrote to the king concerning him, and showed him his rank and the good birth of his parents. When the king had read the letter, he rejoiced in St. George greatly, and immediately appointed him general over five thousand men, and wrote down that he should receive three thousand pieces of money every month, besides his taxes, for the public treasury, which were remitted to him and the king sent him back to the eparch with much royal pomp. When St. George came back to his house, the whole city and the eparch came out to meet him, and they carried him into his house with great joy. On the morrow his mother spread out a feast for the whole city, for rich and poor alike, male and female, small and great, and she distributed much money among the widows and orphans. Then she invited the eparch and all his company, and made a great feast for them three whole days. And the eparch wrote down St. George as his son, and the heir of everything that he possessed. And he betrothed his daughter to him, and made him lord over all his house. And he was associated with him in the affairs of government, and lived with him until ten years were ended. When St. George had completed his twentieth year, he was so exceeding strong and valiant that he was the leader in the fight, and there was no one among all the company of soldiers who could be compared with him for strength and beauty, and the grace of God was with him, and he gave him such beauty and strength that all those who saw him marveled at his power and youth. When he went into battle, he was a terror to those who saw him, and to those who stood up against him. And when he rushed upon the battle array of the enemy, seated upon his horse, he carried his drawn sword in his hand, and he cried out to them, I am George of Metellini, Melitini, and I come against you in anger. And straightway the weapons of battle fell from their hands, and he destroyed them all, and he carried away their spoil. In short, God was with him in all his ways. When St. George had completed his twentieth year, the eparch was anxious that he should be celebrate his marriage with his daughter. But he did not know that Christ was keeping him a pure virgin bridegroom for himself. While the eparch was meditating these things in his heart, he went to his rest in God and left everything that he had to St. George. And the good God wished to lead this very valiant man to himself, that his only name might be glorified in him. And he made this suitable counsel come into his heart, saying, Behold, I hear that Dedianus, the governor, has gathered together a number of governors to him in the city of Tyre, and respect of the boundaries of the empire. I will arise and take gifts and money, and will go and give them to them. And I will ask them to make me eparch in the place of my fathers, who have passed away. So he arose straightway, and took much money and many gifts, 
and put them in a ship with himself and his servants and went to the governors. When the saint had come to them, he left his servants in the ship with all the baggage and came up to the governors at once. And he met the lawless Dadianus and saw the idols before him and people offering up sacrifices to them with great zeal. And he was stupefied and entirely for a long time he said within himself, Why did I leave my own house and the beauty of a Christ-loving city in which they worship the Lord of heaven and earth by day and night, and come to these profane and lawless ones who have forsaken God and worship? Why did I seek the rank of count from the hands of these godless and lawless ones? Cursed be these polluted lawless governors and their dominion, which shall pass away in a moment with them. I know that the Lord will receive me to himself, and I will not seek a destruct destructible kingdom of this world, but I will seek the kingdom of my Lord Jesus Christ, which endureth forever. And I will not return to my native city, to my mother, and now enough of my life in this world, for, la for I will rely upon my Lord Jesus Christ, who endureth forever in his goodness to give me strength to die for his holy name and to take my bones again to my place of sojourning upon earth and to lay them in the sepulcher of my dead ancestors. When St. George had meditated these things in his heart, he returned to the ship to his servants and told them everything that was in his heart. And they entreated him, saying, Master, if it is to be so, let us return to our city with the ship, and let no one know for what purpose we came hither. St. George said to them, Far be it from me to return to my house to look upon the face of my mother again. But I will die in this place, for the holy name of my Lord Jesus Christ, the King of heaven and earth, and that which is beneath the earth, the Lord of all things. And now receive ye your freedom and your wages, and swear to me by God the true Almighty that ye will not return to my house again while I am alive, lest my mother and my sisters know of my condition and bring only death upon themselves. But now receive ye your wages, and take each one of you three pounds of gold and ten changes of raiment, and go wheresoever ye please, in the whole world, my city alone excepted. And if ye are alive and hear that I am dead, do me the kindness for Christ's sake to take my body to my native city and bury it. When the servants of the blessed man George had heard these things, they wept a long time, but afterwards they saluted him and went their way. Now, one of them did not return to Diospolis until the holy man consummated his martyrdom, and three of them dwelt with the holy man in the city of Tyre to witness his strife. And the blessed man distributed the great wealth which he had brought among the poor and the infirm, and the gifts which he had brought for the governors he gave away entirely to the destitute and he gave away his very clothes to the naked. Then St. George leaped out among the impious governors and cried out, saying, I am a Christian openly, and I fear not your madness, O governors of violence, for your gods are devils. May the gods who have not made heaven and earth perish from under the whole heaven, and let every one who worships them Hold his peace. When the dragon of death, the lawless Dadianus, looked upon him and saw that he was refined in body and fair in face as the light of the moon when she shines, and that he was altogether handsome in his form like precious, pur, pure white alabaster, he knew straightway that he was well born 
and that he was the son of an eminent eparch. And he rose up, speechless, marveling at his youth and his gentle answers. And he answered and said to him, All we upon the earth are filled with all the good things of the gods, and we are very dear to them. And thou thyself art numbered with us in honor and majesty, and by thy noble bearing thou showest that thou art of exceeding high rank. And now be it known to thee, O beloved one, the beauty of whose countenance I love, that during the three years which I and the sixty-nine governors whom I have gathered together from all parts of the world have been sitting here, during these three years, I say, we have not heard such a word as Christian uttered throughout the whole world until this moment. I know in my heart that thou art most noble, and that thou art mighty in thy strength and in the multitude of thy riches. But neither the other gover governors nor the multitudes which surround them will regard thee with the same respect. But now let the matter be manifest to thee, O noble one. It is not only we and the governors that thou hast despised, but thou hast also despised the righteous gods themselves. It is meet, therefore, for thee to repent, and to be changed in heart, and to worship the gods, that they may forgive thee thy first ignorance. As for us and the governors, we will take thee to ourselves as, our one, as one of our beloved sons, and thou shalt receive from the gods and from us all the greatest honors and imperial rank, and thou shalt be ruler over ten fine cities, with their suburbs, from whatever part of the world thou shalt choose them. St. George, the truly beloved man, answered and said to him, Cursed art thou, and the lawless governors who are with thee, and the foul idols to which thou givest the names of gods. They are not gods, but devils. Perish thou, and they together. And the governor was enraged, and said to him, I spoke to thee as a father, speaking to his son, and I advise thee for thine own honor and welfare, and thou hast despised us like a stupid and silly man. But tell me, whence camest thou? What is thy name? What is the name of thy God? What are the names of thy parents who brought thee into the world? Why hast thou come hither? Now the blessed man did not wish to reveal his name, nor the lofty rank of his parents. And the governor and all the other governors said to St. George, O beautiful youth, we adjure thee by Jesus Christ, whom thou callest God, to tell us what is thy name, and the name of thy parents, and the name of thy city. If thou who begot thee are alive, if thou hast brother or sister, what thou seekest, and for what purpose thou hast come to this city. Now, because they had adjured St. George by the name of Christ, he declared, saying, Inasmuch as ye have adjured me by the name of my God, I am unable to hide anything from you. I am a Christian, and the son of a Christian and no one of my family was ever an idolater. My father was Anastasius, and the governor of Milatini, and was the son of John, the chief governor of Cappadocia. When the emperor saw the valor of my father Anastasius, he demanded him from his father John, the governor of Cappadocia, and appointed him governor over Milatini, and the whole country of Palestine. My father, Anastasius, was twenty-five years of age when he received the office of governor, and the emperor gave him a company of three thousand armed soldiers for the maintenance of his authority over the whole country of Palestine. And Anastasius sought out a noble lady after the superior rank of the people of Melitini, among the great ones of the town, whom he might take to wife in holy wedlock. And they advised him, saying, In all this city there is no one meet for thy rank and dignity and greatness except Kira the Agnosta, the daughter of Dionysius, the Count of Dias 
uh, of Deus Polis, who is associated with the rule of your majesty. For she is a virgin, aged eighteen years, and there is no one of like rank in the whole country of Melitini, except her father and his house. And Anastasius commanded, and they straightway brought her father, Dionysius, and he gave him her dowry, twice her weight in gold, and many presents, and male and female servants. To her he gave raiment, and gardens, and fields, and vineyards, which could, could not be confiscated, and he took her to wife, and he loved her exceedingly, so that he forgot Cappadocia and his parents, and he lived in Palestine until God visited him there. When my mother, Kira the Agnosta, the noble lady, bore me to him, he called my name George, after his father's father. And again my mother bore him two sisters. The name of the one was Cassia, and that of the other, Mathrona. My blessed father, Anastasius the governor, went to his rest and left me when I was ten years old. One of my sisters was six years old and the other two. After this, another governor, whose name was Justice, was appointed in the room of my father, and he took the place of my blessed father to me. He, moreover, appointed me general over five thousand soldiers, and wrote my name to the king to receive three thousand pieces of money every month and he knew nothing of what was in his house, except what he ate and drank, for it was I who ruled his possession and his house. And he betrothed me to his daughter, that I might take her to wife in happy wedlock. And while he was purposing to carry out our marriage, the time of all men came upon him, and he departed from the sojourning of this life. And I buried him in the sepulcher of my blessed fathers, May God grant them everlasting rest. Amen. As for myself, I carried out my military duties satisfactorily, and by the skillful working of my lands and the generosity of my mother, I acquired wealth, and with wealth came honors. And then in a ship of my own, I came with my servants to this city to present gifts and offerings to you, and the other governors, that ye might make me governor in the room of my fathers, who have passed away. But when I saw that ye had forsaken the God of heaven and earth, who had granted royalty unto you, and that ye served Satan, I said in my heart, Let every kingdom which proceedeth from Satan and his children, which ye are, perish. And I gave all my gifts and possessions to the lesser brethren of my Lord Jesus Christ, who are more worthy of them than you. And I came to you to chide your folly, for the things which ye worship are not gods, but foul devils. Now, behold, I will inform you of the whole matter. I am a Christian, boldly, whatsoever ye desire to do unto me, that do. When the governors heard from him that he came from Militini of Cappadocia, and that he was the son of the chief governor, they were afraid. And they spake to him with flattering words, saying, O youth, we know thy rank and the good birth of thy ancestors. Come now, listen to us, and let our advice be acceptable unto thee. Offer sacrifice unto the gods, that thou mayest receive from them not only the office of governor held by thy ancestors, but also the rulership over the whole world which we will give thee. Furthermore, next in order to these governors present, thou shalt appoint whomsoever thou shalt pleasest to be count in every province of the whole world and they shall be generals and commanders and leaders under thy authority in every place. The just man answered and said, This counsel of yours is exceedingly wicked, and it would lead me to the destruction with you. And now, O lawless ones, 
tell me to what God ye desire me to offer sacrifice. Dedianus replied, George, we wish thee to offer sacrifice to Apollo, who spread out the heavens. The blessed man answered, If Apollo had in truth spread out the heavens, thou couldst rightly have called him God. And if Poseidon had in truth made fast the earth, thou couldst rightly have called him God. Likewise, art thou not ashamed, O godless, wicked one, and dragon of hell, to call this impure and diabolical idol by the name of God? I will now make mention of some of the saints, not for thy sake, nor for the sake of the godless governors who are sitting with thee, but for the sake of these multitudes who are here present, to whom, O governor, wouldst thou compare Apollo? Wouldst thou compare him to the great Peter, the arch-apostle, to whom were given the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Or wouldst thou compare him to the mighty Elijah, the Tishbite, who was an angel upon the earth, and who was taken up to heaven in chariots of fire. Is he not more excellent than the wicked sorcerer Poseidon? Or Samarachtos, who, who, the profane, who worked enchantment by fire, and who lived with the defiled one, whom they call Demeter, or who gave birth to the seraphim, the sea warriors, who on account of their deeds were cast into the abyss of the sea? In whom wouldst thou believe, O king, in Jezebel, who slew the prophets, or in the most exalted Virgin Mary, who bore us our Lord Jesus Christ? Be ashamed then, O foolish one, for thy wicked and impure gods are devils. When Dadianus, the governor, heard these things, he was greatly enraged, and he commanded them to strip off the clothes which he had on, and to tie a girdle around his loins, and to hang him upon the wooden horse, and to torture him until his bones protruded through his skin. Now he was twenty-one years and three months old, and it was on the first day of the new moon, and they began to torture the righteous man and his whole body was disfigured with blood. But the blessed man bore such fearful sufferings as these with patience and fortitude. And they forced iron boots upon his feet, and drove iron nails into them, and his blood flowed forth like water. And again they threw him upon his back, and laid a stone weighing six hundred pounds upon his belly until it burst asunder, and his bowels poured forth upon the ground. And they beat upon his head with iron-headed bars, until his brains poured out through his nostrils, white like milk. But he was of good cheer in all these sufferings, for Christ strengthened his soul within him. And again they brought iron knives, the edges of which were like claws, and they sawed his flesh into threads with them. And Dadianus commanded them to bring salt and strong vinegar, and to pour them upon his wounds. Then he made them lacerate his body with hair bands, until his bones protruded, and his flesh fell in pieces on the ground. But the blessed man did not die, for God strengthened his spirit within him. And they threw him upon a wooden bed, and they drove twenty nails through his body into the wooden bed, and they lifted him up senseless, and carried him into the prison. And multitudes of those who were standing by in those days wept for his beauty, and his stature, and his youth, saying to each other, Alas, for the beauty of this youth from Melatini, and the comeliness of his noble body, which the lawless ones are destroying with fearful tortures, such as they have brought upon him this night. And when they had gone to their homes, they spake to their wives and children, saying, Verily, we have today seen with our eyes in what manner and in what form 
and the whole city was talking about him that night. And it came to pass that an angel of light appeared to him in prison in the middle of the night, and there was a great earthquake, and the city was moved to its foundations. And behold, God came into the prison with thousands of his holy angels, and the holy place was filled with exceeding precious incense. And God called out to St. George, saying, George, my beloved, rise up healed and without corruption from the couch on which thou sleepest. And he straightway leapt up without any pain in his body, and he was like one who had risen up from a royal feast. Then he cast himself down and worshipped the Lord. But he took him by the hand and raised him up, and saluted him lovingly, and laid his hand upon his body, and filled him with strength, and said to him, O beloved one, be strong and of good cheer, for I will be with thee until thou hast put to shame these lawless kings. I swear by myself, O George, my beloved, that as there has never arisen among those born of woman one greater than John the Baptist, so there shall never be any one among the martyrs that can be compared with thee, or be like unto thee. And behold, these seventy lawless kings shall torture thee for seven years, and thou shalt do many mighty deeds, and shalt die three times, and I will raise thee up again. But on the fourth time I will come to thee on a cloud of light, with the celestial hosts and the prophets and the apostles and the holy martyrs, and I will bring thee to the place of safe keeping, which I have prepared for thee. When the Savior had said these words to him, he gave him the salutation of peace and filled him with full joy, and he went up to heaven with his angels. And the blessed man was looking after him, and rejoicing greatly and blessing God until daybreak by reason of the words which God had spoken to him. When it was morning, the lawless governor, those who were with him, commanded that they should go into the prison and see if the righteous man was alive or not. When they opened the door of the prison, they saw the saint standing up praying, and his face shone like the sun, and they marveled greatly and ran and told the governor everything, and they commanded them to bring him up to the tribune. While they were bringing him up, the saint said, My God, my God, hasten to me, O my God. Why hast thou forsaken me, my God? Haste thee to deliver me. When he had come to the tribune, he said, O tribune, O tribune, I am, I and my Lord Jesus Christ, have come to thee and thy Apollo. And when the lawless ones saw him, they marveled and said to him, How is it that no harm has come to thee? And who has healed thee? The righteous man said to them, O lawless ones, ye are not worthy to hear with your own profane ears the name of him that has healed me. Then Dadianus was furious with rage, and commanded them to tie the saint to four high stakes, and to give him four hundred lashes on his back, and after that to turn him round, and to give him four hundred lashes on his belly, and his lacerated flesh fell to the ground piece by piece, and his blood ran like water. And Dadianus made them bring hot ashes and lay them on his body and pour vinegar and naphtha over his flesh. And he caused eight soldiers and five military tribunes to watch over him in prison until the next day. Now the fire was kindling in the whole body of the blessed man, and he was in great suffering. And the Lord Jesus Christ saw his sufferings and that he was unable to speak at all and came down from the summit of heaven and spake with him, saying, I am strengthening thee, O my beloved George. Stand forth from all thy sufferings, and be of good cheer, for I am with thee. The righteous man arose, and God laid his hand upon all his body and healed him, and he gave him the salutation of peace, 
and went up to heaven in glory and honor. And the blessed man sang psalms in prison until the morning. When the soldiers and the tribunes who were guarding him saw what had happened to the saint and that he was strong, they marveled and told the governors. Dedianus, the governor, said, George is an archmagician, but I will hear no more of him until I can bring an archmagician more powerful than he. And he straightway sat down and wrote a rescript saying, Dadianus, the governor, writes to the whole world, Greeting, let any magician who has the power to put an end to the magic of the Christians come hither to me, and I will give him one hundred pounds of gold and two hundred pieces of silver and every sort of possession, and he shall be second in my kingdom. And this rescript was read in every place, and behold, there appeared before the governor a magician, whose name was Athanasius, saying, O king, live forever. Command this man called George to perform something before thee, and I will destroy his magic. Dadianus rejoiced greatly, and said to the magician, what thing wilt thou do in my presence, that I may know that thou canst overcome the magic of this Christian? Athanasius said to the governor, Command them to bring me an ox. And he commanded them to bring an ox. And Athanasius spoke some words into the ears of the ox, and he split asunder into two pieces. And the governor laughed and said, Verily, Thou art able to vanquish the magic of the Christians. Athanasius said to the governor, Let them bring me a pair of scales. And when they had brought them, the, they threw the parts of the ox into the two pans and the scales, and they came out equal to one another. Then Diodonus, the governor, caused them to bring St. George to him. And he said to him, It is for thy sake that I have mentioned, summoned, this arch magician into my own kingdom. Thou must either overcome his magic or he will overcome thine. Saint George said to the governor, the Christian who has taken refuge in Christ never works magic, O impious one. And the saint said to the magician, hasten my son, and what thou desirest to do unto me, do speedily for I see that the grace of God has drawn nigh unto thee. Then Athanasius took up a cup and filled it by his magic and invoked the powerful names of demons over it and gave it to St. George to drink. And when he had drunk it, no evil happened to him at all. Athanasius said, O oh, George, I will give thee another cup, and if no evil happens to thee, I myself will believe on thy God. And Athanasius the magician took the cup and pronounced the names of demons more evil than the first over it, and gave it to the righteous one, and he drank, and no evil happened to him at all. Then Athanasius threw himself down at the feet of the saint and said to him, I conjure thee by Jesus Christ to give me the sign of the cross of Jesus, whom thou servest, that he may open to me the kingdom of heaven. When the holy martyr saw his faith, he struck the earth with his foot, and there welled up a stream of water filled with an exceeding precious odor. And the blessed man prayed quietly, and Thomas the apostle came and baptized Athanasius, the magician in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and he obtained the remission of his sins. And the apostle gave them the salutation of peace secretly, and him himself from them. And straightway the fountain of water returned to its place. When the governor and those that were with him saw what had happened, they were silent and marveled. And Athanasius cried out before the governor and said, I am a Christian, and I thank God and his servant George that he hath numbered me and the workmen of the eleventh hour among his servants. 
and I hope that his mercy will receive me through the prayer of George, the holy and mighty martyr. And the lawless governors were enraged, and they commanded that Athanasius should be taken outside the city and have his head cut off with the sword. So he consummated his martyrdom on the 23rd of the month, on the Sabbath day. May his holy blessing be with us all forever and ever. Amen. And the righteous man turned to the governor and said to him, Do unto me whatsoever thou pleaseth. And the governor answered, By the God, O George, I will make an end of thee. And he made them gather together workmen and materials to make an exceeding high wheel. And he made them fix in it one hundred sword blades, each a cubit long. And they filled it entirely with very sharp iron knives and drove deadly iron spikes and hooks into the flat part of the rim of the wheel. And he caused two flat tables to be made beneath the wheel, having parts filled with spearheads and nails, and parts filled with cooking knives, having edges like saws. And there were two poles of olive wood which fitted into cavities, and twenty men worked each pole to turn the wheel. Then Dadianus commanded them to bring the blessed man to him, and when they had brought him, he said, Behold, George, if thou wilt worship Apollo, thou shalt receive a scepter of royalty from me. But if thou wilt still belong to Christ, then look upon this machine which I have made and into which I will cast thee in order to put thy body to retest, O thou valiant soldier. The saint said, I belong to Christ. Do unto me whatsoever thou wishest. Then Dadianus commanded them to put him on the wheel, and that forty men should make it revolve. When the blessed man saw the instrument of torture which was fixed in the wheel, he feared for himself because he carried flesh which was exceedingly tender, and he said within himself, I shall not escape with my life this time. Then he straightway spread out his hands and prayed, saying, I praise thee, O my Lord Jesus Christ, and I give thanks unto thee that thou hast esteemed me worthy of the worthiness of healthful sufferings even as they crucified thee, my Lord, upon the cross, and set thee between two thieves. And behold, they have made a double-tearing wheel of torture for me, for thy holy name's sake. O my Lord, hearken now, O Savior, to thy servant George. O thou being unsurpassed from all time, O thou unchanging crown of the martyrs, who has spread out the heavens like a chamber, who in wisdom pourest out dew upon all creation, when it is parched and dried up, who hast made the clouds drop down rain upon the earth, on the just and unjust alike, who hast weighed the mountains and hills in a measure and scales, who hast rebuked the disobedient, wicked, and lawless ones, and hast cast them into the lowest and darkest part of Amenti, where thou now art in the bonds and fire of Amenti, and are tortured by wicked dragons. Rebuke, O my God, all these impious ones, and let nothing stand against thy command. O thou, who in the last days didst appear to us upon earth, and didst take flesh through the God-bearer, Mary the Virgin, by an unfathomable and unknowable mystery, the true offspring of God, who didst walk upon the waves of the sea, and whose feet were not wetted by them, who with five loaves of bread didst feed five thousand men, and they were satisfied, who didst rebuke the sea and the waves, and they subsided everywhere, and were obedient upon thee, for all creation is thine. Let now thy mercy come upon us and upon me, thy servant George. For with thee there is mercy, and to thee, and to thy good Father, and to the Holy Spirit belongeth the glory forever. Amen. When he had said, Amen, 
they threw him on the wheel, and he fell down upon the cutting machine, and they dragged him over at once, and he was speedily put end to end, and his bones and his flesh were destroyed. Then the tyrant cried out before the governors, who were round about him, and said, There is no god save Apollo, and Hermes, and Zeus, and Heracles, and Athene, and Scamandros, and Poseidon. These are they who have established the heavens, who have dominion to kings, and who make the mighty to have power upon earth. Where is now St. George's God, whom the magistrates of the Jews slew? Why has he not come to deliver him out of my hands? And Dadianus commanded them to take the fragments of his bones and flesh and the earth which had drunk his holy blood and to throw them into a dry waterless pit. And they piled up dirt over it, saying, Lest the Christians find a fragment of his body and work miracles with it. And Dadianus, the sixty-nine governors, arose and went in to eat, rejoicing that they had overcome their enemy. Then straightway the whole air became black, and the sky was covered with clouds, and there were thunders and lightnings, and the whole earth shook to its foundations. And the holy archangel Michael blew with his trumpet, and the Lord came upon a chariot of the cherubim with thousands of angels, and stood by the pit. And the Lord said to Michael, Speak unto this pit, saying, Give me the blood and the bones and the flesh and the pieces of the righteous man George. For he said, I shall not escape with my life this time, that he may understand with all his heart that I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Michael laid them before him, and the Lord took the bones in his hand, saying, O my son, George, the hand which fashioned Adam is now about to fashion thee, my beloved. And he breathed into him and gave him the breath of life. And St. George arose from the dead, and the Lord embraced him and gave him the salutation of peace, and went up to heaven. And St. George was looking after him. And he arose and came to the lawless governors and the soldiers who had thrown him into the pit, and said to them, Know, O lawless ones, that I am George, whom ye slew and cast into the pit. When the impious Diodonus had considered him, he said to the soldiers, It is his shade. Magnesius, the governor of Armenia, said, It is not his shade, but it is like him. Anatolius the general said to them, Are ye not ashamed, O godless ones, to hide the truth? Verily this is George, the servant of the living God, whom my Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, has raised up from the dead. And therefore I, and all the soldiers who march with me, believe on my Lord Jesus Christ. Then the impious Dadianus were enraged and commanded them to take them outside the city and to divide them into ten parts and to slay them with the sword. In this manner they, they consummated their martyrdom on the twenty-third day of the month and received their incorruptible crowns. Now there were martyred three thousand soldiers and Anatolius the general and 9,000 people of the multitude who were standing by, male and female, and St. George stood by comforting them all until they had nobly consummated their martyrdom. May their holy blessing be with us all forever. Amen. After these things, Dadaianus commanded them to throw him onto an iron bed and to fasten him to it by stakes driven through his back. Then he made them fill a brazen vessel with lead, and heat it until the lead was as liquid as water, and he made them open the mouth of the saint, and pour it, pour it boiling hot into his belly. But no harm happened to him. 
Then the impious one commanded them to pull the stakes out of his body and to hang him up head downwards from the branch of a tree and to tie a stone to his neck. And he passed ten days and ten nights hanging down until his blood ran out of his nose like water. When ten days had gone by, Dadianus the tyrant took him down, and there was a little breath left in him, and he made them lay him upon the ground and hack his body with a sword from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and they hacked him to pieces. Then he made them beat his head with hatchets until it split asunder, and they cut off the top of his head and his legs with axes. And he made them bring a large red hot iron rod and thrust it through his right ear. And some servants came and drove it through his head until it came out on the other side. And they lifted him up like one dead to carry him to the prison. Now the righteous man was in prison and was suffering great pain. And re by reason of the tortures of his holy body. And at the third hour of the night, when the holy man was in agony, the Lord Jesus Christ came to him in prison with his holy angels, and the whole prison was full of light. And the Lord said to him, George, behold, I command thee to arise and stand upon thy feet healed. And he straightway arose, and he was whole. And the Lord embraced him, and laid his hand upon his whole body, and filled him with comfort, and said to him, Arise, and go to these impious governors, and put them and their gods to shame. Be of good cheer, and fear not, for I am with thee always. And I say unto thee, O beloved George, that there shall be joy in heaven over thy endurance, and the angels shall rejoice over thy good fight. Behold now, thou shalt endure the tor tortures of these impious governors for six years, and shalt die thrice. But the third time I myself will come with my holy angels and will receive thy soul, and will make thee to lie down in the bosom of Abraham and Isaac and Jacobin in the paradise of their joy. When the Lord had spoken these things to him, he gave him the salutation of peace, and went up to heaven in glory. And St. George was looking after him, and he passed the whole night in prayer until the daybreak. When the morning came, the lawless governors commanded them to bring St. George to the tribune. Magnentius, the governor, said to him, O oh, George, I want to see a sign at thy hands, and, if thou do it, verily, by my lord the sun, and by the moon, and by Artemis, the mother of all the gods, I will believe upon thy God, Jesus Christ. St. George said to him, I know that thou dost never speak the truth, but tell me what thou wilt ask now. The governor said to him, Behold, there are seventy thrones here, made of different sorts of wood, of which some bear fruit, and some do not. If these, through thy prayer, bud, and put forth roots, and the trees which bear fruit are distinguished from these which do not, I will believe on thy God, Jesus. And straightway the Saint George bowed his knees, and prayed to God, when he said, Amen, the Spirit came upon the thrones, and they budded and put forth roots, those which bore leaves and fruit, and those which did not bear fruit, sprouted with leaves only. When Dadianus and the other impious governors had seen what had happened through the righteous man, they were greatly ashamed, and they cried out, saying, A great guard art thou, O Apollo! for thy manifested thy power in dry wood. And the lawless governor commanded them to put St. George upon a brass bed 
and he made them bring two iron nails, each a cubit long, and make them red hot, and drive them through his two shoulders into the bed. Then he made them bring an artificer to split his head open with an iron axe, and he made them pour boiling pitch through the opening until it filled his body and ran out through his mouth and ears and from under him. And immediately the fire kindled in his head, and in all his body he became as a dead man. And they drew the nails out of his shoulders, and cast him into a brass ox. And they heated the ox, which the blessed man was in for three days, with vine and cypress wood. And the Lord looked upon the sufferings of the righteous man, and came to him upon a cloud, and extinguished the fire under him, and healed all his body, and the brazen ox split asunder. And the blessed George came forth like one who had been bathing in a bath. The Lord embraced him, and filled him with strength, and gave him the sal salutation of peace, and went up to the heaven in glory. And St. George was looking after him. Then the blessed man stood up before the governors without any blemish upon him, and when the multitude saw what had happened, they cried out, One is the God of George, O Jesus Christ, help us. Then the governors caused the multitude, which stood round about them, to be beheaded with the sword. Thus five thousand souls consummated their martyrdom and received the crown of life on the tenth day of the month. The holy man was encouraging them until they consummated their martyrdom peace of God. Amen. After these things, the governors commanded them to bring bundles of thick vine stakes, which they sharpened with knives. And when they had set the righteous man upon a stone, they stuck them into his whole body, and they gashed his thighs and stuck them in them. Then they pulled out the nails of his hands and feet, and pricked the places with the sticks. Moreover, the attendants thrust two sharp sticks up his nostrils into his head. Then they rolled him on the stone, and the sticks went into his whole body, until his blood ran down upon the ground like a stream of water. And the righteous man suffered greatly during this torture. And then he made them fasten him by his back to a plank of wood, and put another plank on his belly, and they nailed the two planks together, and so held the saint fast between them. And they brought a huge iron saw, and sawed him in two, from his head to his feet. So he gave up his ghost. And immediately the governor saw he was dead. They commanded a large brass cauldron to be brought, and the body of the saint with his blood and all his flesh and anything of it that had adhered to the sticks of the teeth of the saw, they had, they had admonished to be thrown into it. Then they threw lead and asphalt and pitch into it, until the flames mounted up to a height of more than fifteen cubits. Now the cauldron was placed in a pit dug in the earth to the depth of thirty cubits, and the governors commanded them to pile up earth over the cauldron and the pit to the height of nine cubits. And they built a fortress for the governors over the pit, saying that the Christians may not find the least particle of one of his limbs, or they will build a martyrium over it. And when the attendants were going away, behold, there was a great trembling in the air, and the sun became dark, and the stars appeared at midday. And the Lord came down from heaven with thousands of angels, and the choirs of the saints, and the twelve apostles were with them, and David the king of all the prophets. Now the whole place was filled with so great a light that all those coming into the city, and even the impious governors, saw the light which fell upon their faces. And the Lord came to the place where the cauldron was, and commanded the archangel Gabriel to cleave the earth and to bring up the cauldron. Then the Lord cried out over the ashes of the bones of the righteous man that were in the cauldron, saying, George, George, 
I am the God who raised Lazarus from the dead, and I now command thee to stand up and come forth from the cauldron. And the righteous man arose straightway, and stood up perfect without any defect in him at all. And the Lord embraced him, and filled him with power and consolation, saying, O George, my beloved, be strong and endure, for I have established a throne for thee in the heavenly Jerusalem, the like of which there is not among the thrones of all the martyrs, which have been from the beginning. And there shall never be like unto thee among those who are yet to come. O George, my beloved, and all the multitude of the prophets and the apostles came forward and saluted him, and said to him, Verily, thou art blessed, O George, the beloved of God and his angel, and of the cherubim and the seraphim, and we glorify ourselves in thee, and in thy great endurance, and especially because thyself alone hast confessed the name of God in boldness throughout the whole world, and the fullness thereof. For this reason, our Savior will confess thee in heaven, and thou shalt dwell in unspeakable glory before the face of the whole creation of heaven and earth. And he was filled with joy, and the Lord gave him the salutation of peace, and he went up to heaven with his angels and all his saints in great honor and glory. And the blessed man came into the theater of the city with his face full of light, and he cried out, saying, O oh, all ye governors, and ye that are with them, O oh, all ye soldiers, and every person in this city, come forth, all of you, and look upon me. For by the might of God I am alive. I am the Galilean of George from Melatini. I am he whom the godless governor slew and buried in the earth. But my Lord Jesus Christ raised me up from the dead, for he is the God of heaven and earth. When the multitude knew that it was George, they cried out, saying, There is no God in heaven or earth except Jesus Christ, the God of George of Melatini. And a certain woman among the multitude came, whose name was Scholastolite, who saw the miracle which had taken place, and believed and cried out to the martyr, saying, O oh my Lord George, my son was yoking his ox to plow in the fields when it fell down and died. And now, O oh my Lord, help us, for we are poor. The righteous man said to her, Take this little stick, which I now hold in my hand, and go to the field and lay it upon the ox, saying, George, the servant of the Lord God, says, Rise up, O ox, from the dead. And she did as St. George had told her, and the ox lived. And she glorified God and continued with St. George. Now there was a multitude of people standing round St. George who was teaching them the knowledge of Christ. And they cried out, One is the God of St. George, the valiant soldier of Christ the King. The governors said to the soldiers, What are these loud cries which we hear? The soldier said to them, It is for St. George who has risen from the dead. And the multitude cried out, believing that his God had raised him from the dead. When the governors heard that George was alive again, they were wholly stupefied and feared greatly. And they said to each other, Perhaps it is not he. The soldiers said, Behold, we will bring him to you, that you may know of a certainty that he is George the soldier. And they brought the saint to the throne, with the whole multitude following after him and crying out, We are Christians, boldly. And they cursed the governors, and were enraged at them. And the governors commanded the soldiers to attack the multitude, and they slew them from the third hour of that day until the tenth hour of the next day. And the number of those who received the crown of martyrdom on that day was 8,500 souls. They entered heaven with glory. May their holy blessing be with us all forever. Amen. After these things, the governors turned to St. George and said to him, How didst thou rise from the dead? The blessed man said to them, My Lord Jesus Christ, for whose sake I have suffered all these tortures upon earth, 
raised me up from the dead. And one of the governors, whose name was Raclelius, answered and said to the righteous man, Verily I marvel at thee, how thou hast come forth from this cauldron, when thou wast fragments, and hast been buried in the earth. And now thou wouldst desire that I should believe on thy God, in respect of the thrones which budded. But we do not know if it was thy God who wrought this miracle, or our gods. And behold, there is he, a rock sepulchre, in which some of the ancients have been buried. Now if thou prayest to thy God, and he raises them up alive, I myself will believe upon them. The blessed George said, I know that thou wilt not believe except by the fire which shall consume you all. Nevertheless, for the sake of the multitude standing here, I will make manifest the glory of my Lord Jesus Christ. Arise then, thou and thou whom thou wishest, open the tomb, and bring hither before this multitude what is therein, that the name of my true king may be made manifest today. Then Rachilos the governor, and Dadianos the governor, and Dionysius, Dionysius the governor of Egypt, rose and opened the stone tomb, and brought out the rotten bones of those who were dead. And the governor said to him, O George, the bones are rotten and have fallen to dust by reason of the length of time. They have been buried. The righteous man said to them, Bring hither the dust. So the three governors made the attendants carry the bones of the dust which they had found, and bring them and lay them before George. Then the blessed man bowed his knees and prayed to God, and straightway there was a mighty earthquake, and lightning and thunders, and the Spirit of God came over the earth and the bones and the dust. And there came forth from the dust five men and nine women, and a little child. And great fear came upon the governors and the multitudes who were with them by reason of the miracle which took place, and they were all alike frightened. And the governors cried out to one another. They cried out to those who had reason from, risen from the dead and said to him, What is thy name? He replied, My name was Boaz. The governor said to him, how many years is it since thou didst die? And he that had been dead replied, Four hundred years. They said to him, Had Christ come into the world when thou wast alive? And he said to him, Not yet. And the governor said to him, What god didst thou worship? And he said, I worshipped the god Apollo, a deaf and blind and soulless idol. It came to pass that when I died, they threw me into a river of fire, which flowed along in the depths of hell, and which consumed me mercilessly, and they kept me in its torturing waves for years. And the idol Apollo was in it, with me, and inflicted great sufferings upon me, saying, No, O wretched creature, that I am not God, but a soulless idol. Why didst thou forsake thy God and worship Satan? For this reason thou shalt now receive everlasting punishment with me. And after a time Jesus, the Son of the living God, came down into Amante, and a cross of light went before him, and all Amante shone with splendor, and he carried away all the captivity of those imprisoned with him. And when it was the Lord's day, God looked upon the remainder of those who were being punished and gave them rest. But to us who served idols, there was never any rest given at any time.